hi, hello everyone. Welcome back to the lobby, GameSpot's weekly video game hangout here every Wednesday in San Francisco. I'm your host, Mike Mahardy, here with uh, quite an eclectic crew today compared to normal. Rob, you're uh, you're always on. What's going on? Not a whole lot. Uh, Kelly's here, but I think she, or at least on the airport or on the way to the airport soonish, right? I don't know. But uh, Kelly is out. She's going up to uh, play some Destiny. I don't know if we're allowed to tell people that, but there you go. Uh, <laughs> Pete Brown is not feeling well. He is under the weather. Uh, he's got a few things he's working in from home on. Uh, this is Michael Hyam. Hi. Hi. Uh, you got some hands-on time with the Xbox One X recently? Sure did. So we brought you on to talk about that. Oh, no. Quick quick thought before we go to Jake and the news and stuff. About uh, One X? Yeah. One word to describe it. Uh, Powerful. No, it, don't say that. I'll kick you I. off the set. I. Okay. <laughs> and Jake Decker, you were on last week as well. I was on last week. I'm back. You played Horizon, uh, Zero Dawn, The Frozen Wilds, Call of Duty World War II, uh, and I got next. <laughs> and you got an Xbox One X, yep. but you spent all night downloading updates. So you didn't get to try it yet. Yes. Is I mean, right? unless you count like scrolling through the dashboard, trying it, then. We'll talk about, I want to ask about the dashboard and stuff soon. Um, and Rob, you spent a day at uh, EA in Redwood Shores playing Battlefront 2's multiplayer. So we're going to talk more about that. Yeah. Uh, first, as always, I want to get to some news. We do have a giveaway I'll talk about later in the show, as always. Uh, first off, last week, Blizzard showed off Overwatch's new character, Moira, Moira, the support character who also does healing, uh, who heals and does damage. She is on PC uh, Public Test Realm right now if you want to go check her out. But uh, they showed off, as per usual with this team, they showed off the actual kind of cinematic trailer mixed with gameplay of her. Here you see Joey and Tay tried her out in a stream. Uh, I didn't hear whether they liked her or not. I know, like, Joey said he liked Doomfist, the most recent edition. But, yeah, if you want to go try out Moira or check out... Our, actually, you know what? Check out our video first before mm. you uh, I was talking out. Joey and Tay are two resident Overwatch experts, I'd say. I was talking to Joey about when they announced him. I was like, do you think they'll announce a character? And he's like, no, it hasn't been leaked yet. Which, well, yeah, because Sombra... <laughs> which is funny, because all the other ones, right, have been leaked? Through these, like, ARG stuff, right? Sombra was, like, all those hacking teasers. Doomfist was been, had been, like, teased in in-game maps throughout the weeks leading up to his announcement. Um, and Moira kind of just came out of nowhere at BlizzCon, which that was, like, probably the biggest news from the show, aside from World of Warcraft uh, Classic. Which uh, you know, I, maybe I'll finally get into World of Warcraft with this. No. <laughs> ten years later, how many years? More than ten? Uh, thirteen. Thirteen. Thirteen years of World of Warcraft. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thirteen. Uh, years. So yeah, you can go back and play that out. What is the battle for Azeroth? Is the new expansion? That's, that's the out? new expansion. Yeah. yeah. Uh, cool. And also, if you were kind of surprised that a new Need for Speed game was coming out, like I was, we have a review up for it on Gamespot. If you want to go check that out, our Need for Speed. Payback review is up, uh, I believe. T -t 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 oh, no, we had a uh, freelancer from the UK wrote it. But, uh, yeah, it doesn't seem like it's that great of a game. We gave it a 5 out of 10, which means mediocre, which just means not that great. It's interesting because the last time I heard about this game, I think it was E3. <laughs> yeah, that's what a lot of people are saying. It's like, yeah. wait, what? This or saw it at E3 and then, uh, oh, snap, it came out. Yeah, not a lot of awareness around its release, at least on our end. Uh, but yeah, you can go check out the more in-depth review uh, by freelancer Richard Wakeling. And uh, we will be maybe talking about that more in the coming days. I probably won't have the chance to play it, but there you have it. Uh, also, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is coming to Zelda tomorrow, Thursday, November 10th. Is that it? Is that correct? Yes. No, November 9th. Apologies. I have no sense of time. Uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 2, there's a new side quest, the free side quest going to... Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild tomorrow. I think Once I'm, you finish it, you get Rex's outfit from Xenoblade Chronicles 2, mm -hmm. the upcoming RPG on Switch. I think I'm more excited about the side quest than did, the did actual. They, me too. I always like, look yeah. at that. Like, that's a dumb looking costume. Yeah. Look, at this, look at the expression on Link's face. He's like, get me out of this. doesn't look happy. Mom, take it. He looks like Randy wearing take the, the pink bunny outfit in Christmas Story. Did they say what the side quest is going to consist of at all? Or just. No, I have no idea. I don't think so at okay. all. It's free too, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's just an, up Will an update. Will you be playing it game. at all with like Peter yeah, on stream? Um, if Peter's feeling not under the weather, I think we're, we're, we'll do above like the, the weather. Sure, above the weather. Cool. Weather. Uh, I think we'll play that tomorrow and uh, just post like a let's play or something like that because that game is fun and I like playing Zelda a lot. Like a lot. I think you're the only <laughs> one. Yeah, in the world. Four hundred and ninety-five hours. At least last time I checked. <laughs> yeah. You're checking, you're checking on Rob's playtime? Yeah, I do. <laughs> is, uh, so Ballad of the Champions is December, correct? That yeah. DLC? I don't know. I, I, I pre-ordered all those Amiibos. I can't remember if... Did you really? No, yeah. Well, Seriously? Yeah. 
uh, just to see what they do. I got what are their names? Shit, Daruk, Ravali, Urbosa, and Urbosa. Yeah, yeah, I got those. They look I don't, really I'm not cool. a Meeple person, but I like those. Yeah, those Meeples are. look great. Urbosa is like huge, and I, well, Daruk is too. But I definitely want Ravali. <laughs> yeah. Ravali's good. He's really Rivali's cool. Ravali's Amiibos now. Right. Rito are cool. They're way cooler looking than they were in Wind Waker. They were like those little toad looking bird things. Um, and to end on some bad news, unfortunately, Perfect World Entertainment shuttered Runic Games. If you're a fan of Torchlight One or Two, Two, like I am, uh, fantastic dungeon crawler loot fest a la Diablo 3. I actually think it's better than Diablo 3 in, in a few ways. And they made the more recent Hob. Uh, Runic Games was shuttered, and based on what Perfect World was saying, it sounded like they're kind of restructuring things to go for that game as a service uh, thing more in future months and years, uh, unfortunately. So best of luck to all the people that worked on Torchlight 1, 2, and Hob. I didn't get the chance to play Hob, but I heard it was pretty good. Um, you know, like our best wishes go out to them, and uh, that's some bad news to hear. But uh, one more time before the end of the show, actually, I want to pimp our Extra Life stream. We, on November 17th, starting at noon, we're going to start our 72-hour live stream between the U.S. office, the U.K. office, and the Australia office for the Extra Life charity for sick children. And we are going to be playing PUBG. We're going to be playing Smash Bros. We're going to be probably eating some disgusting stuff for donations. I'm thinking of maybe doing some XCOM 2 in some respect. Like, maybe if people donate, like, $5, I'll make them a character in a playthrough <laughs> and then see how long they survive. Um, Rob's already bored. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, John Luke is heading up planning for that. So, I think we're having one final meeting, like, later this week, and then we'll uh, we'll have more concrete announcements on a page. And we, m- we might do uh, a little more of an announcement kind of later this week slash early next week. But November 17th until November 20th, noon until noon. Stop by. We'll see you there. Uh, cool. So we'll just jump into segments. First off, Horizon Zero Dawn has the Frozen Wilds DLC. It is out now. Expansion, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jake, you spent a lot of time with it. I spent a little bit of time with it. I didn't finish the expansion. I think I have a different uh, perspective on this because I only ever played like five hours of Horizon in February. Oh, really? And then fell off it. Jake, you beat the game, played a lot of it, and then went back to the expansion. Hey, Richard, while you're in here, can you turn off our... I'm hearing our audio. Thank you. Sorry. Uh but yes, you yourself were actually, you played a lot of the game earlier this year. Now you're returning to it. So first off, I want to kind of get into, from a lot of people's perspective, this is a tough game to relearn. Complex combat, I'd say, kind of difficult, but did you have any of that experience? Yeah, so I was talking to Peter a little bit about this, and he was like, oh, it's an easy game to jump back into. And I was like, really? Uh, and it is in a sense because the world is beautiful, uh, the the setting is great, Aloy's a great character, all that stuff is awesome. But... When it comes to the combat, it can be tough to remember what's good against what, what weapons you should be using here, how these work. Uh, so and then, that, and how like, to do that quickly, right? And how to, yeah, because, I mean, you have to react fast in this game. Right. Even the symbols of the, what do you want to call it? The symbols of the ammo types, I confused, like, hard point, precision arrows, hunter arrows. I kind of lost track of what all those were. Yeah, it was, same with me. It was... There, there was definitely a little bit of a curve that I had to relearn. However, once you get the hang of it again, it's it, it feels so good. The gameplay in this game is top notch. Like it is, I, I wasn't wild about the story. I thought it was entertaining, but just being able to get back in there and fight some of these giant machines is so satisfying. Like they added the yeah. the it's a grizzly bear. It's called a frost claw or something like that, but it's essentially like a grizzly bear, and it's like this towering beast that's insanely fast and its weak spots are on its back there's some on its stomach but like i I mean you just sprint at them and slide under its legs slow down time and like shoot underneath it turn around shoot its back it's you feel like such a badass Um, man i yeah there are so many fond memories i have of this game where it's like you know speaking on like um, I guess I want to even say that it's like elemental different types, right? Like, and, you, and you're crafting, and you're like, I remember like, okay, I need to create, yeah, like a hard point spear or something like that. Well, I have to go out to here and stalk in the bushes, and then we finally see the, you know, said creature. There is some, it's so gratifying to harpoon them and, you know, yeah, staple that into the ground. Like, that, there is such an enjoyment with like hunting, um, like the, it is, I think the rope caster or whatever. Like yeah. Yeah. I love it when there's one of those giant birds and it lands and you just pin that thing to the ground and then you start hitting it with hard point arrows or whatever. Right. For those who don't know, the Frozen Wild is a whole new area called the Cut. Way, way north. Uh, Arctic kind of snowy vibe as you can see. New monsters. I want to get into that. But uh, how Ooh. easy was it to kind of jump into this new area, the expansion's actual content from the main game? 
Um, so first you have to be, I think it's level 30, level 32. I should have checked. It. Well, you, so there's like a boss fight right at the beginning to kind of level yeah. check you, right? Um, yeah, so you're supposed to be like level 30, level 32. Uh, but actually getting there, apart from like, I don't know, kind of like reorienting yourself, it's pretty easy and it's seamless too. Okay. So it's not like... I know like Fallout kind of did that a lot where it's like here's a new area and then you get on a boat and it loads into a new area. This is actually, you, you can essentially just walk there. Okay. Um, you do have to go through like tunnels and climb some stuff, but it's cool how seamless it is. And once you get in there, you visit a town and then the world opens up. Uh, it's not huge, but I mean, it's dotted with plenty to do. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it's Blood and Wine, Witcher 3 size, but it's definitely an entirely new area, a new mm-hmm. kind of a new biome. I mean, there was snow stuff in the main game, but this seems like way more of the Arctic vibe, yeah, I would say. Yeah, it looks gorgeous. And I, I Peter played on the PS4 Pro. I've been playing on the regular PS4, uh, and I think it looks stunning. And then I was looking at his gameplay, and it looks even better. Like, it is <laughs> still like, a beautiful it. game. The, um, in general, kind of, we won't go into spoilers for what happened in the main game, uh, for those just joining on YouTube or Twitch. Uh, this is Horizon Zero Dawn, the Frozen Wilds expansion. Um, this is out as of yesterday, was it? Yeah, it came out Tuesday. Yes. So this is out, so you can play this now. Um, but, yeah, my main question is, and I kind of already touched on this, but as someone who played a lot of the game, A, is this returning, is this worth returning to? And then B, I guess for someone like myself, I think I could speak more to this, whether it's it serves itself well if you're just getting into the game. But Jake, from your perspective, do you think this is worth returning to, um, considering all the other games that people might be catching up on? Or is this like a second chance for Horizon almost for people who might have missed out because it was a packed spring? I. It's interesting. I don't think. I. Hmm. Hmm. I, I think it's worth returning to this game. Definitely. It is a it is a packed fall right now and it can be tough to do that. There's so many other great games out. But I think if you haven't bought a lot of these games like Wolfenstein, Assassin's Creed, whatever, if you're, if you're waiting for the price to drop, this is only fifteen dollars and getting back into this game is so much fun. And like the gameplay still is is top notch. Um so I, I would say yes, it's worth going back into unless, you know, you have a stack of games you're trying to get through. Then yeah. maybe maybe it's not worth it. But one thing Peter was saying was that playing it made him want to do a new game plus, which after playing more of it, I really want to do that as well if I had the time. So mm-hmm. I think it's a good excuse to honestly start the game over if you liked it as much as I did and just kind of play through the game. And the new DLC fits in much better that way, I think, as opposed to like being at the end of the game and then kind of taking this mm-hmm. detour. Yeah, because it's not, it doesn't actually factor into the overall main narrative arc, right? Or it factors into it, but it's not going to like largely affect it if you don't yeah. know what's going on. It's, it's like a side story that, I mean, I, yeah, it's not, it's not that important to Which the I think it the needs game. to be, right? I mean, like another example that I'm thinking of was Dead Space 3's DLC that just completely changed the ending of not just Dead Space 3, but the trilogy. And I, if you haven't played that by any chance, and you should, because Visceral just closed, and those that trilogy is worth playing. I remember that DLC actually changed the ending of the trilogy. It was like they were like, "Oh shit, we should change it a little bit to actually uh, open up the possibility of another game or something like that." Obviously, that won't happen at least under Visceral now. But uh, Horizon Zero Dawn presumably will see a sequel at some point. It did really well for Guerrilla. Um, our friend Danny O'Dwyer was in Amsterdam yesterday. He's shooting a documentary about the making of the game, going from Killzone to Horizon. It's one of those cool stories about a studio just completely pivoting what they were doing and uh, nailing it. Horizon didn't really, you know, register with me earlier in the year. But from my perspective, coming into it with the DLC now, what you were saying, I think it fits in really well. As someone who only ever played five hours of the base game, now that this is a part of it, I hit like level 30 and I went right up to fight whatever the the robot was. I forget what they were called. And it felt like it fit in really well because once I finished that, I went back to do all the late game uh, main story stuff. And it fit in well. And... I would say I do see this kind of as a second chance for Horizon for people who might have been busy with Neo or Resident Evil 7 or, I don't know, what else came out? Gravity Rush 2. I mean, Zelda. Zelda, Zelda was like a week after, right? Yeah. Like, th- that's probably the main thing that pushed me off of it. It definitely is, now that I think of it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, a lot of people here, because I, I think it was you who had it before, and then we got Switches, and you're like, I have to put this aside. So I took it and kind of... Well, at the time, you're like, I have to check out Zelda, which turned into 495 <laughs> hours later. Oh, shit. What happened? I mean, but I knew what I was doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I knew I was going to get lost, and that was like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, but, so, that, so it's nice to see this. I mean, obviously, like Resident Evil 7 has DLC coming out in December. This is coming out. Um there's other stuff coming out too. There's more DLC expansions that kind of release later in the Z- year to Zelda. remind. 
and Zelda Ballad of the Champions. Like as if we need another <laughs> reminder that Zelda came out this year. Um, but it's I think it's a good like game of the year primer for people who are really into that stuff. Uh, while I'm on that topic, we are starting our stuff at the end of the month. I think we'll be making all our announcements December at some point. For people who, again, who care about GameSpot stuff. Uh, Agents of Mayhem, right? That's like <laughs> oh. highest on the... <laughs> oh, yeah. Man, we talked about that in the lobby. Goatee. You bring that up all the time. <laughs> so Horizon Zero game. Dawn, the Frozen Wilds DLC, that's a mouthful. Uh, it is out now from Guerrilla Games on the PlayStation 4 as of Tuesday, November 7th. So you can go check that out. If you haven't played the game yet, I highly encourage you to check it out. If you have played the game, as Jake said, it's worth returning for. Uh, so there you go. Cool. Uh, the newest... Call of Duty installment. Who oh boy. Yeah, I think we all played this. Yep. Uh, so rather than me and Jake just chatting, uh, Rob, <laughs> you played some of the campaign last night. Finally, you've been you played two, a little two and a half of uh, missions for the campaign. Uh, played. A, I did play a good amount of the uh, multiplayer beta, but I would imagine it's not too different. For context, if somehow you don't know, this is the first year that Call of Duty is going back to World War II since Call of Duty World at War, which Treyarch made, but the year before that was Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare from Infinity Ward, kind of when it pivoted off of its World War II roots ever since 2003. Uh, once, you know, Jason West, Vince Zampella broke off from the Medal of Honor team to make the Medal of Honor Killer uh, codename game, became Call of Duty. Uh, as you can see here, it sets the tone for what, in my opinion, is a very cliched by the books World War II game. Looks gorgeous, as you can see here. You got Josh Dumel, you got the dude from the Black Donnellys, a very short-lived TV show, which I seem to be the only one who remembers. He plays Zussman, your, <laughs> your comrade. Uh, either way, anyway, you're on a landing boat, you, you jump off the side, you go storm Omaha Beach, you clear some machine gun nests. How many times have we done this before? No, that was good. Thanks. I thought that was actual game audio. Rob, uh, what, did you, what did you text me last night uh, after playing two more missions? Well, I mean, like, what, keep I it, mean, I could pull out my phone. Keep it appropriate. I probably <laughs> no, should. Not verbatim. Um, <laughs> what was your overall sentiment? My overall sentiment was what you were kind of addressing just now is that um, cliche, but just the tropes. I mean, cliche, like, it's it, to me, it's it's like so heavy-handed saving Private Ryan in, like, every action of what you're doing. I mean... You're hopping over to the side of uh, the boat here. You're doing Bangalores. Mm -hmm. And then just the dialogue in general. I, but I, I guess what I was going to say is I found like um, there are certain characters in this game. I guess I don't want to spell it too much. That they the lines are so cliche and, and tropey to like old World War II lingo and stuff and attitude that it doesn't fit the plot. Mm -hmm. Um, this character here you're looking at on the right is, was what I'm alluding to. We're like Sergeant Pearson, Sergeant Pierce, like the, the game sets up like this bond you have with these other four, um, soldiers on your squad. And it's just, it's what you see in the trailer. It's like, you're far away from home, uh, farm private. boy, oh, farm boy, from Texas. Farm, bo uh, farm boy, like welcome to the first infantry. And it just felt out of place to me where it was like, did they not go through training together in did, the first infantry? Like... <laughs> It just the line in itself just it's like overly macho and yeah. everything he says just makes me want to like not play the game to be honest because I don't know it's it's such a I mean if I hear the term boots on the ground one more time I'm gonna blow my brains out but oh, every Jesus time Christ. that they say it's returning to boots on the ground oh, combat shit. right because Infinite Warfare I actually think people are forgetting how decent that story was actually because this game explores like the toll of leadership with because uh, Sergeant Pearson Josh Dumel's character and the one grabbing you right here Lieutenant Turner they have this rivalry which like it's kind of unrealistic in the sense that he's a lieutenant and a sergeant is like pretty much disobeying him all the time and I don't know why they don't address that but they're kind of like this it becomes this tug tug of war between and someone who cares about the men and he cares about civilians at certain points but then sergeant pearson's more by the books just do the objective poor leadership you think and then of course they there's this struggle between those two kind of it's power struggle and i feel like the story doesn't know whether to focus on that and they've been saying they want to make this authentic but i can't tell you how many quick time events there are i can't tell you how many turret defense sequences there are it felt like i was playing not just uh, the return to Call of Duty World War II, but like I was playing Call of Duty in 2005. It just looked better. Yeah, it, it's funny you mentioned the quick time events because um, we were playing the Call of Duty stream leading up to the announcement for this game. There was like, uh, I, was, I was playing Call of Duty 3 and I was like, oh, these silly quick time events, haha, this is such an outdated thing. 
that games aren't going to do anymore. And then little do you know, they do the same thing in this game as well. And another thing too that when because I played the campaign and played a ton of the campaign, mm-hmm. um, there's just there's too many moments where like shit is like too crazy. Like I you're agree. you're one guy, like and there's like trees falling and things are falling on you, but you escape like the the bell tower is one thing. I th- and, I'm so well, glad let's you not that spoil out. that. But yeah, <laughs> well, well, there is an underlying sentiment to what you're saying. But yeah, sorry. Yeah. Not- <laughs> there's just and then there's uh, the train moments. Uh, and like I think far. that's a mission afterwards. It's like there's just too many of these. Oh, I made it out of the skin of my teeth, or this thing could have fell and killed me. They, like if it landed one inch closer to my and you, brain and, or something. And the fresh and like I I agree with you, and I'm like trying to fight that sentiment. I I feel like of like well you know it is a video game right like, but to what extreme like do these things need right. to go it's out a video of control game. there's there's a zombies mode where you're fighting undead monsters and it's scary and it's you know it's corny and cheesy that's fine because they're that's what they're going for there's multiplayer which of course is just going to be try to like they're trying to let you have fun with other people and have the progression and they're not trying to be authentic but they've said time and time again that they want to be authentic in the campaign and they want to do boots on the ground combat because other the other teams Treyarch and uh, Infinity Ward haven't been doing that this being a sledgehammer game um, it's just so ironic that the reason Call of Duty was originally formed was because Vince Zampella and Jason West were upset with how the Medal of Honor games were continually going toward this like secret agent vibe, like this superhuman World War II soldier, and they wanted to go back to that authentic character, uh, like soldier story. Call of Duty 2, Call of Duty, uh, the first one in 2003, the PC uh, exclusive. Those were more about individual soldiers within this experience, you know, going from the British to the American to the Russian front. Now in this game, there's like there is spy movie chase sequences. Yeah. There, when you're in the Battle of the Bulge is here because it's a World War II game, and people, someone said, of course that they're going to tell a similar story. Thousands of soldiers had the same story. There are so many different directions you could have gone with World War II rather than the Saving Private Ryan story. But the the trees, like artillery, starts uh, falling. What would you do? Like what in every single World War II story we've heard in real life, what, what do people do? They get down as low as they can because the trees are splintering. Right. What do you do in this game? You're like, let's get out of here, and you run like a hundred yards while there's artillery exploding the forest all around you. Like they said that they started this. Uh, Michael Condry and Glenn Schofield are the head of Sledgehammer now. They want it to be authentic. So much of this doesn't feel authentic. Like it doesn't. I, it's, it's it feels like they're going back to like the the same thing that Medal of Honor was doing. And those I like those games. I like Frontline when you're kind of like infiltrating a German base. There are moments in this game where it gets kind of clever with uh, some espionage stuff. But and you're to, a, you're a private, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. And you start yeah. off private you start Daniels. Off, and you know, yeah, like to say what you're saying. Like the the set pieces are so close together. Inconsistent, where it's like <laughs> now you're now you and someone else just decide to like hop on a jeep and like bust through enemy lines, yeah, like yeah. like get the wheel. I'm gonna get on. Uh, I'm gonna like get on the gunner position, and then like I don't know. It's like Indiana Jones status, right? Yeah. Where it's like then like three German jeeps come out of nowhere and intervene <laughs> as you're going 80 miles an hour. They're on yeah. your sides, and it's like I don't know if a private. <laughs> In the U.S. military, infantry was was doing uh, this. You'd, you'd know about that. Oh, and then after it's done, your your captain's like, hey, why don't you get your head out of your ass <laughs> and start acting like a soldier? You're being like a wuss right now. And it's like, did you did you see what I just did? I just, like, that happened so often. Did I just you saved, see this? I just saved a battalion of American troops. Killed what do you want me to do? Killed 100 Germans yeah. <laughs> with a pocket knife. But uh, anyway, it's a good looking game, as you can see. And it's I don't really want to just harp looking. on the campaign. But even, okay, I, I'm sure there will be people saying it's a video game. They had to make it dramatic. I get that. Yeah. There are better ways to do that. I, lit- I counted. There are at least 10 quick time events where you get in this melee match, saving Private Ryan like with this Nazi. And you're pressing square, and then you're lining up the analog stick to press triangle to pull the pistol out the last second, shoot him in the face. You're, there are these heroic events. Where you could oh, save yeah. your your comrades, it is the most choreographed thing ever. It doesn't feel heroic. There's this countdown dial that if you don't shoot the Nazi by, he'll kill your friend. Right, and it, and even that feels out of place too because moments before when I'm actually playing the game, I have eight of my fellow comrades right behind me. Yeah, and then and, it's just this lengthy twenty second of me, you know, yes, yeah, as you mentioned, saving Private Ryan trying to prevent a knife from going in me, which like literally two feet away. 
or eight of my friends. What are they doing? Also, how? Also, uh, hey Jefferson, how did you get into this bunker? We just it was locked and we blew it open. What were you doing here before the invasion? Espionage. Yeah, are you on the Nazi side? Should I be saving you? Like, how did he get in here? There's just I don't want to just pick no, this campaign it's, apart. It's, but like, I know that's I'm being I harsh, feeling. but I think I am too. It's but not it's, even it's a fun hard. game. I don't think it's not a fun campaign. There are quick time events. There are turret defense sequences. So okay, people will say you don't have to use the turrets. If I have to choose between M1 Garand, where I'm defending a wave of Germans approaching this farmhouse and this artillery, why would I not use this 30 cal uh, machine gun right next to me? But it feels like a game that came out in 2005. It looks like a modern game. It feels like a World War II game I could have played 10 years ago. Um, and I wanted them to, you know, like, I think going back to World War II at this point in time, there's a high bar to meet. It's not a, it's not, Christopher Nolan wasn't working this movie, and maybe it's unfair to compare it, but, like, Dunkirk did something different recently. That was less a war movie about, like, battles and actual uh, camaraderie. It was more well, about the anxiety. And I mean, this is kind of, this happened way earlier, but, like, you look at Band of Brothers, or not yeah. Band of Brothers. Uh, I mean, that is a good example. Brothers in Arms, too. Yeah. Like, those told very good stories, at least at the time, from what I remember, enjoying yeah. those stories quite a bit, and they felt grounded. Uh, boots on the ground, fish. <laughs> uh, get off the set. <laughs> I don't, yeah, and also, it's he, <coughs> he, sorry, he is uh, almost identical to Colonel Sink from Band of Brothers, I know. who was a real person, and right. like, and, they yeah. were going for Band of Brothers stuff with this. They even say the whole Company of Heroes thing, and then, Toward the end of the game, what's well, the thing, but when you start to realize the story, there's like this personal narrative that has to do with dreams and stuff. It starts to come full circle, and as if we didn't get it, what does the main character say in his voiceover? Seems like everything's coming full circle. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys get to that point? Am I no. the only one? Yeah, don't. It's. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I, uh, I like the opening. <laughs> I, I thought it was cool. I like being back on Normandy. We haven't seen it in a long time, and uh, seeing it in this new engine... Uh, yeah. I thought I thought it was pretty stunning, but yeah, I think right when I finally hit the ground and started playing, it was like, okay, yep, I'm, I, I've I've seen this. I don't know if I need to see more of this. Um, yeah, and I guess because because yeah, I mean like you know not to rag on the game so much. Like I wonder if it's if it's the sentiment that like I think you you two might have like or any everyone here like what I know of like like the World War Two. Like the media that this game like really seems to be influenced by, um, yeah, we mentioned Save by Ryan, Band Brothers. Like those are really like intense and heavy um, uh, films and, and and episodes of a TV show. Like yeah. to to pull from that and then have these crazy intense, bombastic, bombastic like, yeah. you know, uncharted esque like uh, set pieces. It it feels. Like it's fighting itself in that respect. Like mm -hmm. it's hard. It's hard for me to like go for one second and, and see the horror of of war right in the beginning on the beach when there's just like like just limbless dude, mm -hmm. and then to go to a different like really fun car chase. It it just it feels mm -hmm. like they they don't sync up, and that's what I feel like I'm fighting. But you know what? If you don't know those movies and uh, those inspirations, like maybe you will have a great time playing this campaign. Yeah, if you're like 18 today, maybe this is your biggest. Most exposure to World War II, right. to D-Day, to you know, to the Battle of the Bulge, to crossing the Rhine. Maybe this is in in this case. In that case, I would just say go watch Band of Brothers or Saving Private Ryan. They're easily available. But uh, I don't know. There are less cliched ways of looking at World War II from the American uh, standpoint, at least. And this is all an American. Can well, no, not true. There are a couple parts where it branches off to other characters who are not American. But by and large, it's about the American campaign, starting with Operation Overlord. And zombies it. is dope though. Yes, uh, I like enough zombies ragging on the quite campaign. a bit. Let's talk about. So okay, I will say there's not much to talk about with multiplayer, but I think that's actually a good thing. When you they say they went back to the ground, they got rid of you know like a wall running and traversal and the exosuits. <laughs> they replaced those with divisions, kind of these created cl uh, class that specific kinds of characters that get specific abilities like. The paratroopers will have a suppressor. They can attach a suppressor to their gun. Here you got like, the goddamn fucking loot crates, of course. <laughs> um, but anyway, there's the headquarters. They're kind of pulling from Destiny in the whole social aspect of it, right? They've got the headquarters. I don't care about that. It's just kind of filler between the missions. What, the missions is that mode? Is that mode live now? It didn't have trouble at launch. There, there. Yes, actually, there. I think the most server issues with a Call of Duty since like that whole Battlefield <laughs> Four year. Um, right. 2013 was it? I, I could year. be mistaken. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, by and large, the multiplayer is great. The map design, it varies, actually. There are some maps that are my least favorite in the series, but there's, there's some, some that are really very, cool. Very, very good maps. Uh, the USS Texas is really good. 
the the yeah, there's that one I think there's that huge like train thing in the center and basically you can see all of the map from yeah. there. like it kind of abandons that whole three lane approach that mm-hmm. I mean it's still there but it's like not nearly as strictly defined as many Call of Duty maps are now. Yeah, and uh, it does feel like like some of the better ones are like are kind of that lane based uh, thing that Call of Duty has gone towards since like Modern Warfare Two, I would say. But it is fantastic map design. I think if you're one of the people, I think like the majority of people who get this game not for the campaign but for multiplayer, yeah, get this game. It's it's great. It feels like it used to just better. Uh, there's no more traversal. There aren't any infinite warfare, advanced warfare kind of uh, exosuit stuff. There are divisions. It is very more. It's very much more pulled back, which I think it benefits from. And uh, but while we're on the topic of multiplayer, we can talk about the co-op zombies. Which, speaking of Destiny, feels like a raid in the objectives you're doing. Uh, Jake, can you kind of explain? zombies to us as far as yes. how it's different than last year so i think i mean the first thing that i noticed was different was that i go to a window to repair it and you can't which seems which, which is crazy because you you've been able to do that in every zombie map up until this point but yeah it's save one and <laughs> make yeah. some money right <laughs> yeah. like put up all those boards um but yeah it it it, it still is wave based. There's still tons of zombies that are going to be rushing you. And once you hit like the later waves, it's really tough. But yeah, it is kind of like a raid in a sense where you are given objectives and they're not as uh, like obscure as they were before. I'd say like a lot of times it'd be like, yeah, here's the objective, but we're not really going to tell you how to do it. You just have to explore the map and figure it out, which was cool. But this is definitely more focused. Like you can check objectives and you have oh. to work as a team in order to push those objectives forward like for example kind of early on there's one point where there's two switches on opposite sides of the map and i think if you're by yourself you're given more time to hit both those switches but if you're playing with friends you have less time so uh, i was playing with nick and he was like all right you wait here i'll go here and he's like all right i pulled the switch then i pull the switch and it's like all right now we got to meet in the center of the room and we have to activate this machine so we activate the machine this red circle goes around us we're like all right we have to power the machine by killing zombies within this circle once we're done with that we move and we made it up to the giant blimp that floats around the area which is not the end apparently it's very long um yeah but it is like it almost feels like a boss like this entire time you have this blimp flying around kind of raining hell down on you uh unless you know how to deal with it which we finally forgot how to deal with it however we died but yeah as someone who's played pretty much every single game for the zombies mostly mm-hmm. uh i mean not mostly but like that is a huge part of why i play call of duty i think this is the first one i've gotten into in a while um just because they it still keeps that formula but it does a lot of little different things like it focuses more on objectives it there there's feels like there's more of a progression as opposed to just you know grinding to higher waves have you gotten sick of doing the same objectives in the same order on repeat playthroughs because i've only played it like twice so i've only done it a couple times and i have a feeling this will be an issue eventually because in like in previous zombies you kind of touched on this but those objectives were optional right like you could do those if you you could do certain objectives if you wanted to get like the power weapon or Mm -hmm. the pack-a-punch machine this you actually to progress to certain areas you need to turn the power on a certain way so yeah there's a point where you don't have to anymore right like a I Which think, you do, sorry, you do that in the other games, but yeah. still, this one even more so, you literally can't get past, like, the second area mm-hmm. at all. But It's I'm, pretty easy I'm, to do that, though, sure. I'd say. Because, um, like, there is a point where you can just start ignoring objectives, and you'll have the whole map open for yeah. you. But, yeah, I mean, I could see how it would get, get old after a while. They did, they did do certain things to kind of, like, change it up. Like, there's a series of switches you need to hit, and the order changes, and the sequence changes. Yeah. Okay, well, that, so I mean, they, that's, that's nice, at least, if mm-hmm. it's not the exact same thing. Like, you know, in, in other zombies, it's like you have a, you have multiple doors you can open up at mm-hmm. any given time. Yeah, it branches right. when it needs to. And figuring out, that like, the waypoints, is, is that kind of the same? Where it's like, oh, it's easy to do, like, you know, I feel like for some of these zombies, you want to develop uh, a, a circle system, you know, yeah. of just like being able to always move and fire uh, while running mm-hmm. backwards. Well, also, like, there are certain areas that will have the box when it moves, the random weapon box. So you do have to learn the map for sure. Uh, and here you see the mines underneath the castle. Yeah. The and, and, and when I say like objectives, like, it doesn't like give you like a marker, like, this is where you need to go. It, okay. it kind of, it, it's still kind of obscure and that it'll, like, that, for example, you, you don't necessarily know where that is. You kind of have to explore figure that out and there's another point where you have to hit these switches in a certain order and you're given this map in german and it just numbers it just puts numbers down it and like if you don't know the map like i think ben and uh some people in the office were doing it and it took us like 
probably 20 minutes to figure out where all that That's stuff me. was. Me, you, Ben, um, and Jean-Luc. Yeah, it took, it took us a while to figure out where all that stuff was, which it's still cool because it has that aspect of discovery and kind of, or self-discovery. Mm. Um, but it also has a more directed experience for those. Yeah, when you said objective, like, like the objectives were on the... Um, were in the game like that tell you where to go but they don't i just saw one right it was just like find the yeah. second power supply so it's like okay well at least we know what we're looking for exactly. right and and that's hidden in the map so that's that's and nice it's also a little bit more forgiving like you have i Whoa. think they added the lnr powers before um but you also can take way more hits than before which at first i was like all right this kind of like it's no longer the two three hit rule where you get knocked down come with but, 10 but it, exactly, but it like and that's it makes sense considering yeah. the yeah. Probably so frustrating if you were dying that easily when you're trying to do all these objectives. Mm -hmm. um, I love Call of Duty Zombies so much. Uh, they had the Chronicles pack that came out earlier this year, the Black Ops Three Chronicles pack. Yeah, but it was maps a lot from of that. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was from World at War. I mean, because the original one, Nocturne on Toten from World at War, mm -hmm. the when you beat the game, it just rolls and you're like, what the hell is this? That came out after the first Horde mode in Gears of War Two, if I'm not mistaken, but. Still before like all these zombie games came out and all these horde modes came out and I still like they've always just made it interesting and fun like you don't have to be authentic with this there's zombies yeah. it's <laughs> fun as hell and it's it's some it's one of the better co-op experiences that I've ever played you know like zombies lend themselves well to co-op games Left 4 Dead is one of my favorite games but it's I like the Chronicles pack is well worth getting if you don't have that the DLC that came out earlier this year for Black Ops 3 I I can't say enough about Call of Duty Zombies. Even Infinite Warfare is the 80s based one and then the 70s, was it? Uh, yeah, the those Fun are, Land. Those, are ridiculous. Those, ones, those ones are really fun. Um, I will always play Call of Duty Zombies and I, I get annoyed with the actors coming into it, but whatever. It's it's fun. Like Marcellus Wallace is in this. Yeah. I, I, I think another thing Ving too. Ving Rames, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry. It's Marcellus. <laughs> no, it's is, right. What's his name, right? Marcellus is his boss. About to go medieval. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think another thing that I do like about this is the map isn't huge. Like it's, you, you're not like exploring a giant map, which is cool in a sense, but it's really nice to have a more contained, uh, contained map to, mm -hmm. to, to play in rather than like, I think it was like black ops two or something that had that one where you have to take a bus through the entire place. And it's like, all right, <laughs> I don't know where any of these places are. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I love the, the better maps in zombies. They're fantastic. And this one, this one I'd say is up there-ish. I think for me personally, I'm curious if it will just wear thin after subsequent playthroughs. But so far, I'm having fun with it. Uh, so that's Call of Duty World War II. Uh, I don't know we, if there's much more to talk about. We talked about the campaign, multiplayer. Multiplayer, is, they just brought stuff into the division. It's not the same pick 10 system anymore, but it's still very fun multiplayer. It's kind of a return to like the classic Call of Duty without movement, without kind of parkour stuff, if you'd say. I don't know. Uh, did you play much multiplayer in this year? Yeah, I played a lot of the multiplayer as well. And uh, I mean, do you always play Call of Duties each year? Or I f I fell off after Black Ops One, and I kind of like dipped in here and there. But uh, going back to the multiplayer, I think that it was like, oh, I kind of missed this. And then after a few hours, like, okay, I get it. Yeah, I think it's it's more it less has to do with the game because I think that the, the multiplayer is it's well built in the sense that it's there's a lot there's a lot of things supporting it. Like with the divisions and the like, the attachments that aren't they're not too overtly like game changing. They they fit the tone of the game. I mean, you'll you'll have like red dot sites and stuff like that, um, but they're not like they're not. It doesn't look anachronistic while you're playing. Mm -hmm. right. So it makes sense uh, visually in there. So that's not jarring. Then uh, the war war mode's cool. I mean, oh shit, yeah. yeah. Talk about the war mode quick. I don't think we did for people it, who don't know. What it yeah, is. it's just objective based yeah. um, uh, style multiplayer, which has been done before. Obviously, with uh, with operations in Battlefield One, I think that you know Call of Duty's taken this, and Call of Duty's done this style of stuff before. I Was believe. it assault mode back in the day? I could uh, be. I can't, can't recall. Might, I might be misnaming that. Yeah, they haven't, but they they do a fairly. I think it's it's well built. It's yeah. uh, like the the one the one map the snow map where you're you have you're pushing three tanks. You got to get at least two, and then you move on to the next objective. Like those things are really cool because it's it's chaotic. You know, you're trying to flank enemies constantly while pushing objectives. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah this is this is really cool. This is um, well made. Uh, but I think for me personally, it's just uh, I'm not really into multiplayer anymore that much. Uh, so I did pl I played like ten hours, and I was like, okay. 
yeah, I, I like this. This is good. But I have I, I got my fill. Yeah. And uh, I think if you've been uh, like burnt out on shooters, it's not really going to change your mind. Yeah. But if you are wanting to get into a more <laughs> boots on the ground multiplayer, <laughs> this is this is a good one. Um, but I've like I said, I've had my fill. You I, started that. <laughs> I said, don't say it. <laughs> You, when, anyway. you, when you tell us not to do something, we go and do it. If you wanna, uh, if you wanna go more in depth, it, Miguel Concepcion did our review. He that's up on Gamespot. Obviously, he's not here. We have very d- different opinions from one person to the next about any game. Like we're not, we don't all get together in a room and score a game. If you think that's how it works, then that's dumb. Um, but <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. So got Call of Duty World War Two is out now. You can go play it. Uh, very good multiplayer zombies. Different thoughts in the campaign, but to each their own. So let's move on to Star Wars Battlefront 2 multiplayer specifically. The embargo's up. Single player, I don't think you play it, but we also can't talk about it yet. Regardless. Ooh, I think we can now because it is on early access, or not early access, it is. All the whole campaign? No, 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 just the first three missions. Have you guys played any of them? I, I played started, 10 minutes of the first one. <laughs> I played like five minutes. It just minutes. went up for context. It was yeah. like um, this morning, so on the early access, but. I can give you my impression of the first like five minutes. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. we'll save that for next week or something. We can compare uh, our impressions. But like, but, but, but we, spent- we saw the, the the little snippet clip of the cinematic. Remember that where she's talking to her her father, mm-hmm. uh, Iden. There's it, it it starts off with a lot of that feel and that like, it seems very much like a Star Wars game. Even like like the cinematics like, like it feels at home. It's it's I'm engaged like right off the bat. Um, but yeah, we don't really have much say on yeah, single player uh, yet because yes, right now you can, if you have um, a PC or Xbox One and you have the EA Origin Access, you can play uh, the first or play for 10 hours by Star Wars Battlefront 2. Um, and as Jake said, the first three missions. So we'll be doing a lot of that today and on a stream later, uh, yeah. 1 p.m. Pacific, right cool. after this. Um, but yeah, but Rob, Star Wars. You- Rob Handler, you went down to EA Redwood Shores to play a day of Battlefront <clears throat> 2's multiplayer. Yeah. Much has been said about this game. You know, unfortunate or not, it was largely negative because of the whole loot crate was this game pay to win system. <coughs> we will get to that now that you've actually had your hands on time with the final build of the game, or at least in the review environment. Mm-hmm. But overall, what are your kind of broad impressions before we dive into it of the multiplayer in Star Wars Battlefront 2? Uh, compared to the last game, it is better gameplay the feel the look um the classes having a role in the game you, you feel like you're part of the team and, and they've made the changes yeah this is me playing this was the first match i played and i went uh it was mvp it was like like 38 kills i was just laughing uh, how instead of shooting that guy your instinct was to toss a grenade at his stomach this is, this is literally i was like trying to get a feel for it but anyways um yeah, and like you can see there, this the squad icon. I'm getting um, two times uh, the experience when I'm playing with my teammates. In the beta, they didn't really have any clear distinction between like who was in your starting spawn squad or not. Everyone's just a blue icon. So now they're yellow, so you can differentiate that, differentiate uh, with that because, as you know, clones and battle droids look a lot alike. Mm-hmm. Um, so like the changes they've made uh, from the beta seem pretty just and like. And uh, they definitely like implemented feedback in that respect. Um, again, like the you know the um, the active reload on blasters, each gun feels unique. Uh, I, I didn't get to play, so there were two days in the uh, preview event or I guess review multiplayer event. Alessandro said, um, in the end, you were they they said, okay, we're gonna unlock all the cards so you can get a feel for all the weapons and stuff. And he said there was this really awesome like anti tank rifle that you could have for the specialist which is just like an explosive round like really long cooldown and everything but he was showing me and it looked absolutely insane is um, it a double barrel shotgun it's holding this or grenade launcher uh yeah that's like a secondary for the assault class which is right here which is like a shotgun and that's that's on a cooldown ability so yeah the, yeah the classes feel distinct um i'm excited to play with friends and like you know like i'll be an officer so i can like give you guys buff and health like boss people around boss people around with a pistol like it seems like um a very much a great improvement from the last game uh matt oh and god man starfighter mode is the shit i i was watching some footage i had a blast with that mode like is it separate still um yes and no so there's also galactic assault which is where you can um 
like, you know, there's Kashyyyk, which was a map there. Um, each planet can have different, like, areas for different types of modes. So that was uh, Strike, where it's just um, kind of more objective, like, hard point, um, just infantry. And then there's, you know, the map can open up, and it's, you know, yeah, air, tanks. Um, this is some of the dogfighting on Camino. Camino is the same deal, where it's like, this is just the specific Starfighter, Starfighter Assault mode, um, where it's just aerial combat. And it feels freaking awesome. And it looks awesome. This, is, this was my favorite right here. Um, you know, you have like really great map design here, which was not present for the aerial stuff while in the last game, um, in that you, you're given a bunch of obstacles. So if some guys on your six, you can fly, you know, beneath, um, all these structures and like weave in and out of like columns and pillars and get them to like, um, crash and, or hit the waves. Like there's so much to be said about this mode i think it's so much fun and of course the biggest gripe was the were the controls last time we well, talked about all, this to it death super vanilla last time and i was just doing the same thing over and over and i was pretty yeah. much always shooting or yeah i don't know it didn't feel like there was much nuance to it yeah you're right and 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 this i uh, mean every one of these starfighter modes woo, yeah. pro status <laughs> in starfighter mode here um yeah you're dealt with a bunch of different objectives so here it's like um you know defend uh, the clone uh, Star Destroyers from bombers. And if they get past that um, and do enough damage, then it's like prevent them from blowing up the shield generator so there's, uh, you know, the shields go down and then they attack the engine. So there's like a, a bunch of series of objectives um, and each map feels like there's a, a many different ones. Um, it's fresh. I really enjoy it. But again, the controls, like having the... And you can you can leave kind of the previous controls where it's like auto roll. Um but now you have manual roll, so you can actually like do a, a, a barrel roll, right? If you're or, like, a pro, you use manual. Yeah, roll. but um, you know they had Criterion uh, um, uh, Studios like rework all the flight controls, and it feels awesome. Would and you, like, I use a am joystick so stuck. for this, or is it not that deep? You know, it's weird with like dice. Is like the joystick support always rolls out really late, um, mm -hmm. so I'll have to see. But uh, even with controller, uh, it's it's great. Uh, and you can change the, the style, so you can you know you can have roll on the right with pitch, or you can have you know I don't I don't have to get oh, into it. Different game spot. <laughs> that was <laughs> Alessandro. <laughs> yeah. Before we get into uh, like progression and whatnot, because that's been on a lot of people's minds. Mm -hmm. What the, do you do? You, you do see this having a longer tail than the first Battlefront did in 2015? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Might hold your interest longer. I think so. If just Starfighter mode, it was really fun compared to the last game where it was such a letdown because I'm a big Star Wars fan. More specifically, just starships. My God, they're so cool looking. Does having the Clone War content in this game help out the variety, whereas it was just the, uh, oh, absolutely. the original trilogy in the last game? Yeah, absolutely. And and just how many different... Um, there, you know, there are even um, more specific different types of air vehicles, right? You have fighters, you have bombers, you have interceptors. Um, which all have different roles. So yeah, that's that's great as well. I think yeah, and and the how many different types? Yeah, like not, not just Clone Wars, but First Order. Granted, they're oh, yeah. pretty much this exact same Tie Fighters, but they're different. Like there's like a um, the Interceptor First, First Order Tie Fighter has like an ability to like turn the back gunner on. If you remember Force Awakens, how Finn was in the back of that one, mm -hmm. so you could like engage that and you know mess with the guy who's uh, chasing you. Um, there's just a lot more going on, and yeah, it feels and looks. Awesome. <laughs> cool. Uh, just to now, I guess, Phil Elliott in the YouTube chat was saying, do you need a card to get into a vehicle? So I guess that's as good of a segue as any. How does the progression work? Because much has been made about EA changing things up after the criticism from the beta because of the star cards and feeling like this game was pay to win. Now, that, So you spent a day with it. Do you know what level your character got to? Because I know there's some, you can't equip epic cards until you get to level 20, correct? Okay, here we go. <laughs> uh, so yeah this is like one of the most confusing systems uh, as far as progression how to progress in this game I don't quite understand yet like I have to look into it to see what is the the best way to do it and how do I how do I because you know you should you should be able to play and as I said this is something they addressed you should be able to play a class I want to level up assault that's what I want to do and so that's what I did when I first went there is I played about 45 to 30 minutes of assault and I ranked my, my class specific rank, not my overall rank, went from like zero to one in that amount of time. Now, I went out, this is my own experience, this is what happened, and I still have to understand if this is exactly what this all means. I'm enjoying this. 
I went out and I opened up a bunch of loot crates, to which I had enough credits from the matches to open up like two to three. I got a card that was one tier level up, so it was like two notches on the card that was specific to specialist. I put that card onto the specialist class, which I have yet to play, not, a, not one second, and I got that class rank to four. Okay. Without doing anything but opening up a loot crate. Okay. I have to be rank five in order to unlock um, the ability to have a second card slot, and then 10 in order to do that. 10, I am, when I'm uh, level 10, I can, uh, to my understanding, I can then, um, then is the, I have the ability to use crafting parts to upgrade any star card I want. Okay. You want the epic card, which previously in the beta, the was the only way to get one of those the best card right which have like unique abilities you could only get those through opening a loot crate now the only way you can do it is through crafting parts or so from upgrading um an epic to a legendary whatever like system they're calling these things but sorry legendary to epic i believe i don't know what they, i don't even know if they're calling them what the highest card is called is uh, it's all up in the air so i was reading that in order to craft certain weapons you have to get like reach certain milestones like get 50 kills with this right. class etc right. so human players not ai because there's ai everywhere um but yeah human players and then to get the next tier weapon for said class specific class it's 100 and then it's 200 okay so that can take a while it it, it might it, you may think it doesn't but it, it can take a while but so you could not so you would need to get that 100 kills with that class you couldn't just buy a crate and get that level of tier of weapon so weapons are everything you can you can get in the game you can get in the loot crate except for these the best cards okay that um, sounds fair so just saying that sure but I, I told you that scenario and from the beta uh, loot crates now cost um or credits wise which is like the in-game currency um like up to 2,000 credits in order to uh, open up a loot crate. Now, here is what um, I found today. This is the uh, They're not credits. They're crystals. <laughs> crystals are different from credits. Oh, Chris- shit. Crystals are where you put your money into and you can um, open up crates. So it costs about anywhere from 200 to 110 crystals to open up one loot crate. So we did the math. You can see there on the far right, you get uh, for hundred dollars or ninety dollars if you are uh, subscribed and pay the Origin Access uh, fee. You get sixty loot crates. Is basically the match. The math. If you're opening up only troop uh, trooper uh, crates, trooper crates are only you know that's what where you get all the class specific infantry star cards. Then there's Starfighter, which is like. I don't know, 150, I don't know, crystals. So that's where the money is. Now, there's also the thing to be said about loot crates is that like, I don't know, there, there are a lot of weird, frustrating things about this game where you're, you're playing a game and you get a milestone and then you, you are, the only way to open up a loot crate or uh, redeem milestones and rewards is by exiting the game and going into um, like the menus. And then opening up loot crates, you're just always being forced out to like into the loot crate area. And that's really frustrating mm-hmm. to like get something and then have to quit a game. It takes time. It's frustrating. But it's, you can't look any other way where it's just like, what? I'm being just so directed into this, this loot crate system. It's nonstop. And it's frustrating. I mean, I, I I feel like I'm just rambling because no, I, have so many, sounds- I have so many mixed opinions about like how how frustrating it is. Like, you know, somebody is going to do the math on like, on like, okay, I'm not going to I'm not going to spend any money. What is that time frame like? It's going to be long because well, so it's uh, one last thing is that so if I want to level up my epic card, I need to have crafting parts, right? Mm-hmm. Those raise so exponentially where it's like. Uh, if, if it's from, from the beta, it's like 480 crafting parts. You're opening up a crate and you're getting, like I got, I opened up one um, just now because I was playing a little bit. It's like five, uh, five crafting parts in one crate. Like eventually it's going to take you like, you know, like two, two loot crates at like after playing a couple matches. I don't know. Like the speed in which you're getting crafting parts is just going to take so long and there's always that nagging 
thought of like someone paying money and just opening up a bunch of loot crates. I don't know. So, it's, it's there. It's it's there's not much to say. Like so, even with Call of Duty World War Two, you have it takes a lot of time to unlock everything, right? And then the loot crates themselves, you can get loot crates, but those loot crates only contribute to aesthetic stuff. Whereas Call of Duty, you're kind of getting a constant stream of actual unlocks. Here, the actual unlocks are actually randomized and put in the loot crates. So oh, thank you. Now yeah. you're going to have to find the next gripe. Okay, Go. so... I'm um, just enabling him right now. You are. <laughs> I hope I'm being coherent because it's like so... Like It's so I've been injecting messy. coffee into his thigh, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so many times I opened up a loot crate, uh, and this is at this event, where like I opened up one... Um, and I wanted, uh, you know, you're, you're hoping for like a cool Starfighter thing, or like uh, if I open up a hero crate, and I open up a hero crate, and I get, I got like three things. I got uh, maybe five crafting parts, a Darth Vader emote, or sorry, victory emote, and then maybe some credits, like uh, a thousand credits. A Darth Vader, it, you know, you start the game, like six heroes are locked. And require progression to which I, I don't, I'm not quite sure. Maybe it's like, a, you know, 200 kills as a hero, which is freaking ridiculously hard, right? I'm opening up something and I'm getting a card that I can't use for a hero that's by chance if I can get to play him. And by chance if I win a match and I'm MVP, then I get to see that card in effect. You have to be MVP with that character? For, it's a victory pose. Oh, I have, to, I have to have the most kills, I have to have an MVP award, or like most damage or objective points. That's the only time I get to see that card. Damn. How is this loot crate fun in any way? Or, or like, sick, cool. <laughs> like, I, you know what I mean? It's just like, like I, I heard some, uh, another guy at the event said he opened up one and had a similar thing, but like he was given a thousand credits and it was a card that he couldn't use. So it's like, cool, I just gave like, you know, over 2,000 credits and I got a thousand credits back. Like, that just feels like like you're just barely treading water. You're even going back downstream. I just lost a thousand credits. Mm -hmm. You have to play really well in order to get a lot of credits too. You know, like if if I play like if I'm at the bottom of the, of the match because I suck, you're getting like, you know, I don't know, less than a thousand credits. So overall, it sounds like Battlefront Two is well designed in its gameplay and whatnot, but it does still feel like a lot of the progression elements are confusing to the point that it's really encouraging you to pay or at least spend an inordinate amount of time to get better abilities yeah like I, I could have i mean for the most part of what i just said as far as like the examples and like cost and currency like i that's i'm fairly sure that all that is accurate but again like these systems are so confusing and they're so hard to like to just understand that i don't know like alessandro who's uh, reviewing the game he was like what do you think of, the, of this game and he's like it's really fun. Like the progression, or I'm sorry, <laughs> the gameplay is really fun. But he's like, I've never seen a progression system so, like, sounds convoluted. As convoluted, yeah. yeah, and and just baffling. Where it's like, why is this so confusing? Like it's and it's confusing in the sense that the the information is just not provided. Like I just. Like, the game should have a fat tutorial, like, video, like, here's how it's gonna go down, buddy. Watch this shit. <laughs> You'll get it. There's no, it's just like, I don't, I, I'm like doing, I'm, I have a calculator in my hand, like, looking at, like, what's the price for a loot crate? I gotta know. You have to go to Dago Boss so Yoda can teach you how microtransactions work in this game. <laughs> That'd be cool. That's a that's a cool idea. It's a shame because this game sounds fun outside of all of this messy microtransaction loot crate progression problems. And they could patch it later on. Someone mentioned uh, Plants vs. Zombies Garden Warfare. Same thing happened, but then they implemented the opposite. They kind of made it a little shadier. Uh, so here's hoping to keep uh, tweaking it over the coming months. This game released is Friday, right? Or next week? Mm, next Friday. Next Friday the 17th? Yeah. You know, it's seventeenth, the same day we started mm -hmm. extra life. Okay. Yeah. You know what else is interesting too is like you know just because it was uh, nice to compare loot crates because there are so many other games that have loot crates. Uh, Overwatch. Uh, maybe you guys could help me out, but um, the the most you can pay it, was it? It's like forty dollars for. Um, oh, Tay is gonna have to help me out. It's like it's forty dollars like for, for fifty. Forty dollars. Forty dollars for fifty crates. Crates. Forty dollars for fifty crates. That's like. 
compared to a hundred dollar twenty. Compared to a hundred dollars ten. A hundred dollars to sixty crates. And in the description in Overwatch, it says guaranteed four items. Mm -hmm. I was opening crates and I was getting two items and I was getting <laughs> up to four items. Nice. Yeah, because what I Overwatch opened a crate works and I got out two items. Overwatch works out to like a dollar ten per crate, and you're getting four items. They could be dupes, but. Oh, and dupes changed too. They had said earlier that dupes would be um, turned into crafting parts. Not anymore. <laughs> They're turned into credits. Crystals. Or credits. Credits. Oh. Meaning, what do you do with credits? You're opening up more loot crates. Okay. Interesting. So. Were you just going to say something, Jake? No. It, please, in the chat or comments below, if, uh, if there's anything I misspoke on, I would really like those comments to surface up at the top. So what, uh, Berserker always is correcting my... Uh, Math. It's I was gonna say 90, that didn't sound right. 90, <laughs> I was like, 90, you 80 should be cents, getting eighty cents per be crate. Less than a dollar. Eighty cents oh, per crate yeah, or ninety so. something. Whatever. Uh, that's why I don't spend money on these things because I'm not good enough at math to buy. Unless it's Mass Effect crates. Three, as we found out this morning. Yeah, I was just telling everybody the first instance of loot crates that I ever experienced was Mass Effect Three, and I actually spent like a hundred total dollars on those. Holy crap! I was young enough to do that, and I, it was also the first game I ever saw it with, so I didn't realize I was being exploited. So there you have it. You can blame me for this whole loot crate thing. <laughs> Over the years, they're like, it. that guy. We got him to spend 100 extra dollars on Mass Effect 3. Uh, yeah, and then DB Addict and Twitch Chat was also saying, one word, whales. Yeah, there will be people that will spend a lot of money in Battlefront 2, unfortunately. I have you want to know something that we're going to do? <laughs> we do have to move on to Xbox. Well, so, can well, I just say one thing? If yeah. you guys, uh, for those of you watching, um, Eric Tay and I are going to be streaming Battlefront at 1 uh, oh, p.m. Pacific. Yeah, you're enabling everybody. And we're going we're gonna to... No. For science, we're gonna we're gonna do with a hundred dollars. We're gonna test gonna, it. I'm not I'm not gonna be happy about you're it. You're gonna show how much of a waste of money it is. At what time? I, I at uh, one p.m. Pacific. We're gonna do a hundred dollars and see what happens. Okay. Cool. And progress carries over for uh, the origin trials. So thank God. So one I, that would be <laughs> one o'clock Pacific. You're gonna start opening crates with a hundred. We're not gonna start. Dollars. We're gonna play a campaign to like you know cushion the frustration. Okay. Cool. We'll have a loot crate extravaganza with $100 US dollars at 1 o'clock Pacific on GameSpot, Twitch, YouTube, and uh, our site channel. All right, finally, Michael Hyam. Yo. One of our resident tech experts. Ooh, I don't know if I'd say, yeah. Um, I hope uh, you are. We're paying you to be. <laughs> I'm not paying you. I'm just kidding. Uh, Xbox One X came out yesterday. It sure did. Jake, you got yours in the mail and everything. Nick got his. Uh, but we've had it for a couple weeks, I think. Mm -hmm. Microsoft was gracious enough to send one to the UK office and here. Um, people kind of, it seems to be a bit of a wet fart as far as the interest <laughs> around it. <laughs> kind of faded out, I would say. Um, but I'm excited for it because, you know, like this is kind of the new thing. Like PS4 Pro comes out. It's the console updates, the iterative thing that, you know, PCs are always doing. Mm -hmm. Not to that extent yet, but who knows down the road. Yeah. Um, so far, broad strokes, Xbox One X, what is it doing for... Microsoft, what's it doing for the console market in general right now? Um, so, first off, yes, it is the most powerful console uh, that there is. But I think that, I mean, I'll, I'll just say this off the bat, is that, you know, when you when you go into a Best Buy or a Target and you want to buy a TV, everything's going to be, the things that are, are going to be on display are all 4K or 4K and HDR. Best case scenario, right, that you could have as a setup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, 1080p TVs are, like, stuffed away in the corner. Like, they don't want you to see that. Like, I, I was in a Best Buy, like, not too long ago. I was like, yo, I'm about to get a 1080p TV. Where do y'all have that? And, like, they looked at me like I'm a dumbass. And they're, like, <laughs> they're over that way. And I was like... We're in the trash, We're in the basement. You got to fight past six alligators to get there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, um, and looking at the Xbox One, the original Xbox One hardware, is, it's really weak. Um, and like not all games even did 1080p like a lot of games had to do 900p and then uh, upscale uh, so what this I think what this does for Microsoft is saying that you know if if everyone's gonna be getting like 4k TVs and uh, you know all these games are gonna be pushing like uh, graphical quality and stuff we need a system that can at least push that out or handle that at least that's how I see it um, because if the ps4 pro is out there like and everyone's, everyone's looking at the Xbox one it's like well and I'm not gonna get this. I might not get this weak piece of hardware, especially if I'm gonna if I want. Uh, I mean, Xbox One S does <coughs> HDR, but uh, when you get 4K, it really exemplifies the benefits of HDR. So I think uh, that's what you're getting out of it. And you know, for people who are in the Xbox One ecosystem, 
you know, this is uh, this is something for them to look at and say, oh, okay, like Microsoft is they're they're doing something new. They they care about like you know power and uh, they want <clears throat> games to be looking great on their system because. You know, if you look at uh, what comes to load times and just overall visual fidelity on Xbox One, I mean, some of that stuff looks rough. Yo, know, like mm-hmm. uh, Wolfenstein, I know Wolfenstein uh, New Colossus uh, one just came out. Uh, you know, playing on Xbox One original, like the load times are bad mm-hmm. and that game looks blurry as, blurry as hell. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you don't want a, you don't want a console, existing console to be putting out games like that. You don't want that to be like your marquee uh, piece of hardware. Uh, so then, you know, that's where the Xbox One X steps in. And I think it's necessary. Uh, it's not for me. I've always said this, like, you know, as a PC gamer, um, you have to think about the tar- target audience. And then you kind of do these filters. It's like, okay, do you have a gaming PC? Check. Then this isn't for you. Uh, are you? Do you even care about the Xbox One ecosystem? No. Then this isn't for you. Uh, but if you are in in that market, then this is this is a great piece of hardware. In terms of implementations go, it's inconsistent, um, which you would kind of expect during launch. You know, not every game that says it's going to be Xbox One X enhanced is enhanced yet. Uh, there's a lot of <coughs> you can go on the Microsoft website and see the games that are enhanced, uh, and you'll see a bunch of games that are either says in development or in progress. Uh, you know, developers are making these patches because they have to put in the effort to have their games run properly with on this new hardware. Uh, but we did we did see some uh, some games running with the with One X enhancements, like Gears of War Four, and it lo- looks dope. Like it looks great, uh, runs great, uh, and you also have the choices. You'll have um, some cases. You'll have choices too for like performance mode, where I can get like. I can get 60 FPS and stay at 1080p, uh, or I can do 4K get uh, lower frame rate. So you have those options as well. Um, so it's it's not too dissimilar to the PS4 Pro, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, it does have a little bit more power. It will pr- uh, be pushing out uh, higher res. Uh, but in terms of how it's implemented with patches and having your options, uh, it's very similar to the PS4 Pro. Um, it's yeah, it's a it's a good system. But if you if you care about Xbox, then you'll probably care about this. Otherwise, like, cool, like, it's another system. Yeah. So. Have you have you played many games on it yet? No, I, I played uh, Gears of War Four, <laughs> Super Lucky's Tale. Stuff where it does look really good. There are some cases where it was even looking like better than PC. At least yeah. these games, like okay. the, the, so I, the, and the I Windows some, Ten. Games. I guess some. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, we we. Um, yeah, we were looking at that, and I, I, my question is, it's weird. Is it almost, like, too good? Like, did they did they do something to the X version? Because I, I want to say it's, like, not remodeling, but, like, retexturing even? Yeah. Yeah, okay. so, like, it's up to devs what they do with this hardware. So mm-hmm. they can, like, for, for example, in Gears of War 4, I'd say uh, some of, like, the textures, lighting, shadowing looks better than PC Ultra um, because I, yeah. I think that they've done, like, went above and beyond in terms of like those graphical features, um, Coalition it, is also a first-party studio, so it makes yeah, sense that they're really. Trying of course, to push yeah, that. they yeah. want to like it does push the awesome, best though. product. Of course, and yeah, it looks great. Um, you know, uh, and it be- looks better than the PC version. It doesn't run quite as well if you have if you have like a super dope PC. Mm-hmm. Of course, you're going to be getting like 60 plus frames per second. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of like pure fidelity, the Xbox One X version of Gears of War Four looks freaking awesome. But uh, if you read Digital uh, Digital Foundry put out a story the other day about Titanfall 2's Xbox One X enhancements, and it has dynamic resolution, but it also has other graphical features on top of that. So what was that? What ha- and they said that the the Titanfall 2 Xbox One X version started looking worse than the PS4 Pro version because of dynamic resolution. It was dipping to resolutions below what the PS4 Pro would dip to. Oh. So in that way, the game started to look more blurry. At times. Yeah, at times. Okay. Because dynamic resolution adapts to what's happening on screen. Mm-hmm. So at times, it was looking blurrier than the PS4 Pro version. And then, so that that kind of begs the question of like, how consistent are these enhancements going to be? Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard to tell. And you can never know until the patch for a certain game comes out. Uh, yeah. So. so available now as of, you wrote this, 
uh, as of November sure 6th, did. which was two days ago, Monday, I'm going to list some games that have the updates. Gears of War 4, obviously, we just saw. Killer Instinct, we just saw. Diablo 3, Reaper of Souls, Ultimate Evil Edition, uh, L.A. Noir. Yeah, because they did a few Xbox 360 games already, too. Yeah. Uh, Outlast 2, Sonic Forces, hell yeah. Transcripted, World of Tanks, Super Knight Riders, Need for Speed Payback. Uh, so there are some games, I'd say about 15 right now, that are already updated. And then mm. coming soon is a huge list. Yeah. Uh, you know, like Dishonored 2, Assassin's Creed Origins, Halo 5, Halo 3, Hello Neighbor, which will come out, Hitman, uh, Killing Floor 2, Middle Earth, Shadow of War. Like all the games that we were kind of wondering about. Like, I think I saw... Uh, Aaron Greenberg from Microsoft saying within two weeks of launch, they're trying to get the majority of those games yeah. updated. So if you have one right now, uh, if the game isn't updated already, then it should be within the coming couple weeks, I think, based on what they were saying. Um, and then in development, there's an even longer list. Like, obviously, Doom will eventually get this, and Doom, I'm hoping, will look gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's coming on the Switch soon, but it's also just a good-looking game. Far Cry 5, when it comes out, Firewatch, For Honor, Fortnite, Forza Horizon 3, Halo Master Chief Collection, majority of Xbox One games that you care about will probably be updated, yeah. I would say, um, whether it's you know like going into 2018 or in the next coming weeks. Um, but I, I am also optimistic. Um, I think it was a Bloomberg did an interview with Phil Spencer recently, said now that the Xbox One X is out, obviously you have teams still updating it and whatnot, and you have all these individual developers updating their games for that console. Uh, Phil Spencer was saying, yeah, we've admittedly not done the best job with first-party exclusives or even third-party exclusives. Uh, and now he said they're turning their attention to software, investing in new studios, investing in existing studios to bring exclusive stuff to the Microsoft console. Are you optimistic as far as Xbox's future with games specifically? Because that's been the story with Xbox the last year and a half, yeah. two years, been where are all these exclusives. You know, PlayStation 4 Pro is not as powerful, but they do have a decent amount of exclusives. And, uh, you know, I don't want to just beat up on Xbox for its lack thereof. But it's good to know at least Phil Spencer and the Xbox team recognizes that. And they're trying to take steps now that their hard new hardware is out yeah. to rectify that software situation. Um, obviously, you don't have the inside knowledge of someone working at Xbox, or at least if you did, you couldn't talk I, about I, it. I but don't. <laughs> are you optimistic about Xbox's future now that this is out? Do you think it's that big of a change? What do you think it means? Uh, I... Well, I think it opens the door for, for like Microsoft to go out and say, "Hey, uh, you want to develop like stuff for our system? Like we got this powerful thing you can work with." And um, you know, judging from what developers are saying so far, they're saying that it's uh, it's pretty easy to work with. It's not unfamiliar to them. So I think that you know this is something in their in their back pocket when they want to go to someone and say, "Develop for our system," and it's like, "Well, check this out. We got the Xbox One X." So it's it's like. You know, you, and I thought about it too, and that you can't, I mean, you can do it, but it's, you have a lot less in your hand when you, when you point to your Xbox One S as your leading system. And it's kind of like, well, mm -hmm. yeah, sure, we'll develop for that. But like, I mean, when you have something as powerful, powerful as this, um, you know, it's, something to show off it's it's yeah. it's what i would pick i mean jake you just got yours yesterday it's probably what i would pick to play like assassin's creed origins on or something of that sort uh for because it's better looking ostensibly than ps4 pro yeah i, I think what's what i find really interesting like i got an xbox one x uh but i w during the xbox press conference at e3 i think they had like something like 30 plus windows and xbox exclusives but none of those games felt like they they weren't games like oh I can't wait to try this out on my Xbox One X they were all like sort of like <coughs> art dri like art driven you know smaller indie games uh, like Cuphead for example which mm -hmm. is a phenomenal game and then you look at Sony which has less exclusives but the ones that are there maybe not less exclusives that's probably not the right word to say but like the exclusives that they have like really push their console for like Horizon for example I've been playing that and it looks gorgeous like. I want something like that on my Xbox One X. Like, it's cool that there are all these other exclusives, but I think I really hope soon we get something that really pushes the power of this console. Like, seeing yeah. Gears is cool. Seeing that remastered, I never finished that, so we can go back and play that. Looking forward to PUBG. Uh, Hopefully, Crackdown. Um, yeah, Crackdown Three turns around. Yeah, yeah I what, mean, what I what we all kind of saw. Was, I don't know when that was. It was a sorry. little looked a little like I don't know stiff or dated. Yeah, um, and that game. As is like this, the art style doesn't necessarily. I don't look at that and be like, "Ooh, now this game is like going to look great." I mean, like I'm sure the destruction and stuff. Like, yeah, that's we'll what take I'm advantage to. of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it doesn't have that 
look that mm-hmm. like Horizon does, like or yeah, yeah I, I, or I, get, I get what you're saying. Last of yeah. Us, like it, it's just really weird that they just put out this this super high end console with 4K visuals and it's the most powerful console in the world, but. There's no new games to really that they can hang its hat yeah, on. Yeah, there's no like driving force to go along with the console. Yeah, and I and I hope like after reading that story about how Phil Spencer is kind of turning more attention to that, I hope they're really focusing on taking risks and making those uh, like coming up with IPs that are new and interesting that really push the tech forward rather than just another Halo and other Gears because. I mean, those games look good no matter what because they're developed by people who are familiar with the consoles. Mm-hmm. First party studios too. Exactly. I mean, so so is you know, Gorilla. I think Gorilla is first party for Sony, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's. It, I'm looking for. I hope maybe they'll with this new shift towards software, they'll establish like a reason to come specifically to Xbox that you can't get on PlayStation, right? It might mm-hmm. look better. Assassin's Creed Origins might look better. Uh, I don't know if you're gonna go back and play like some or, earlier game, like third party game. It'll look better, but. Uh, and maybe eventually they'll establish themselves with their first party games outside of Gears of War, outside of Halo. I mean, like Ori and the Blind, Ori and Ori 2, whatever it's called, The Whispering Willows. It's fantastic. Yeah, but and I, I'm hoping they can get more along those lines. Like when we first thought Metro Exodus was actually exclusive, that was huge, but it's not. It was just a timed exclusive, whatever. Mm-hmm. And then Sea of Thieves is coming out, and that looks fun. It's not something, again, I would hang my hat on, like you said, but I'm yeah. hoping that this first party installation that they're, they're pursuing is going to establish themselves more as a very viable console for exclusives that people can come to to play Assassin's Creed Origins, like, etc. That was the thing with the original Xbox, right? Is like, yeah, you can get these games on other consoles, but it's going to look the best or like even their exclusives look phenomenal mm-hmm. um, back in the day. And now like they, they kind of strayed away from that. And now that they're kind of putting their putting their. I don't know the phrase, putting all their chips in a stronger, more powerful yeah. console. I really hope that they kind of take that throne again and actually put their push their system to the limits and we see some really cool, yeah, good-looking games out of it. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Because then, like, mostly we're getting is high-resolution versions of games and maybe, like, a bump in, like, its quality settings, which is cool, but... You know, the when you mentioned Horizon Zero Dawn, it's like the the what Gorilla is able to do with the regular PS4 hardware and how great that game looks. Like the how great that game looks plays into the theme of that game. Like uh, everything else, though, I feel like for the Xbox is has been like it just looks good for the sake of like trying to look good. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, like when you want to go out and try and obtain new IPs, new things to take advantage of this hardware, I want to see something like that. Where it's it's visually striking in a way that plays into, you know, it's visually striking for a reason. Yeah, and um, I and I am, imagine that it's a huge risk to take. That yeah, is yeah. like AAA development for, uh, for a system that frankly just isn't doing as well as a PlayStation Four. So right then, I mean, sales aren't going to be quite as strong. But I I think a lot of more people will adopt the system or who will be interested if there is a game that you know, like I've said I think a couple times, like puts that system to its limits. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's going to take a while, though, because, yeah. uh, you know, system doesn't come out and like you're not going to see the best thing uh, coming out of it straight up. Uh, so, I mean, uh, if, if that's their approach from here on out, now that they have took, took care of the hardware, now they want to take care of the software. I mean, like, uh, sounds good to me. I'm ho- I, I just want to see what will come out of it. But we will, you know, we're going to have to wait for that, obviously. Uh, but, yeah, uh, it's Xbox One X is it's I. Right. Like I said earlier, it's wow. well, it's all right. <laughs> awesome. Um, nice. But yeah, and also, it, it's the, um, everyone or not everyone, but people were kind of uh, expecting this to be like a uh, native 4K 60 FPS machine. It's like it's straight up. It's not. I mean, mm-hmm. well, developers uh, would have to make games. It, it, yeah, it can be like it, it can be uh, like you're gonna. Uh, you can make like a 3D platformer that's gonna run 4K 60 FPS. Mm-hmm. But uh, I mean, Forza or no, Forza is 30 4K, right? 30 frames, like four to seven. I can't, I can't uh, tell you off the. Sh- but top once of my again, head. that is first party, right? So they yeah. are more familiar. That's to be expected. Yeah, we hope. Yeah, and then so in games like uh, Assassin's Creed Origins, I think it is going to be 1800p upscaled 4K. That game's already really good looking. Yeah, and that game, that game looks great. I mean, but again, you're not going to get, and it's running in like 30 frames per second. You're not yeah. going to get 4K 60 FPS. That should, shouldn't have been the expectation to begin with. Um, but yeah, it's it definitely like doesn't do that. Uh, in very few cases, it will. Um, but yeah, and then the an- I think Anthem also is uh, targeting 1800p upscaled checkerboarding. Uh, and I mean, I'm not picky when it comes to graphics. Between I, I can tell like native 4K looks great. Uh, 
1800p checkerboarding looks great too like there's a, it's not, nothing to cry over like <laughs> it's, that shit looks still looks dope as fuck so I mean uh, but yeah I'm excited to see what they do on the software side now yeah yeah here's, like I'm optimistic I think maybe now that they you know like it's finally fully into Phil Spencer's tenure uh, at Microsoft he's not like cleaning up other people's messes now Xbox One X yeah. was his and moving forward investing in studios hopefully that comes to fruition and we can see more first party titles from them and uh, more to play than just a few of those first party titles and those third party uh, but yeah so let's uh, close out the show pretty much so that's Xbox One X Horizon Zero Dawn Frozen Wilds Battlefront 2 is not available yet but it will be on the 17th, Star Wars Battlefront 2, or you can play today on Early Access if you want to. Xbox and PC, yes. Xbox and PC. If you have the Origin Access, yes. EA Origins. Or if you pre-ordered <coughs> cool. the game, you can play that three days early, so the 14th. Cool. Yeah. Sweet. Uh, and like I said, we will be doing more with the Xbox One X on the site, I'm sure, in the coming weeks, especially Michael and Jimmy and everybody. Maybe we'll be streaming stuff with that. Rob, at 1 o'clock today, you're going to be paying $100 to see what that'll get you in Star Wars Battlefront 2's Loot Crate system. 40 minutes. Uh, so, yeah, you're, you're kind of doing God's work with that experiment. So we'll see what happens. You and Ty are doing that. Uh, do we have a giveaway, as always? We're going to get to that right now. Uh, two keyboards. They are the... Oh, my God. Rosewill RK 9000 V2 RGB Mechanical Gaming Keyboard. 100% uh, Cherry MX Mechanical Key Switches, 8 pre-programmed LED modes, 5 profile settings, up to 50 macros for gaming applications, media function control, and key rollover. Uh, Shiva sent me all this information. Basically, uh, on our site, you can go and the giveaway page will be up, and you can enter there, or you can look for the GameSpot tweet and retweet it, and they'll also have the link to the site. And we'll pick two winners on Sunday at 5 o'clock p.m. Pacific time. Apologies to everybody else outside of the U.S., but this is U.S. only. Uh, and then one more thing I want to reiterate. November 17th at noon, we're starting our Extra Life charity live stream for 72 hours between us, the U.K., and Australia offices. Uh, I'll be kicking it off on the first segment. I think Jake, you might be on it. Rob, you might be on it. I don't remember. We'll all be on it at some point. Yep. Uh, you could stop by. We're aiming to raise uh, fifteen thousand this year. Uh, I think we'll we'll match that. We'll have or we'll, we'll uh, beat last year. We'll let people come crush, stop by. Crush it. I'll be. I'm sure I'll be drinking some disgusting concoctions for charity for sick children, which oh Rob's money's going to. God, that's right. What did you drink last time? Uh, milk. It was a mixture of milk, hot sauce, soy sauce, mm. uh, jalapeno, cream cheese, schmear. You did it for a dollar, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, like 50 <laughs> I did it for... F no, one, no one actually paid me. They just told me they would. It was disgusting. It was very bad. Uh, no, salmon-flavored schmear. That was my idea. I told them to put that yeah, in. That <laughs> and then Gadge put a little bit of his like volcano sauce in it. And then I stirred it. So that'll be fun. We're going to be playing a lot of different games, multiplayer stuff. Here you go. This, these awful photos of us. Uh, November 17th, 12 p.m., Pacific time. <laughs> there you Look go. at your photo, yo. You Who? look tight. Who? Thanks. Uh, anyway. Good. Yeah, so stop by. Good. That'll be the same day Battlefront 2 comes out. Maybe we'll be playing that, but again, we're streaming that at 1 today. And as always, thanks to everybody in the back. Richard Lee, Eric Tay, Jean-Luc Seipke, uh, Michael Hi, I'm Jake Decker. Thanks for coming on. Callie and Pete will presumably be back next week. Rob, too, I would assume. And uh, as always, we'll be back next Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific here in San Francisco, California. We'll see you then.